Hello, my name is Kurt Fischer. I'm co-editor of the Philosophical Research Bulletin Disputatio out of the University of Salamanca in Spain. Brandom's philosophy of rational pragmatism and inferential semantics has been with us for quite a while now. There is one aspect of Brandom's philosophy that has not been discussed roughly enough, in my opinion. And that is why I asked uh, Professor Brandom if he would like to contribute to a special issue of Disputatio that investigated the relationship between the philosophies of Ludwig Wittgenstein, particularly his later philosophy, and the rational pragmatism that Brandom is proposing. And Professor Brandom was quite enthusiastic about it from the very beginning. He allowed us to publish in a bilingual form an older essay of his asserting and then contributed with a fresh piece that addressed exactly the issue that, was, that we had at hand. And then uh, it occurred to us that maybe we could also conduct an interview to be published uh, in the same issue. This interview was conducted uh, by Maria Jose Frappoli in the summer of 2018, but it has not been until now that this interview has been made available to the public. While Robert Brandon does not really need to be introduced, I will take liberty in saying a few words now about his development as a philosopher. After this, I will invite Maria Jose Frappoli to say a few words in order to give a general impression of his philosophy. Robert Boyce Brandon, born in Buffalo, New York, United States of America in 1950, is an American philosopher, currently distinguished professor of philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh and a member of the Faculty of Philosophy there since 1976. He completed his faculty in philosophy at Yale and obtained a PhD under the direction of Richard Rorty at the Princeton University. He has given the John Locke lectures at Oxford, the Hempel lectures at Princeton, the Howison and Townsend lectures at Berkeley, a William James lecture at Harvard, and the Woodbridge Lectures at Columbia. He has held fellowships at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Science at Stanford and at All Souls College in Oxford. In 2002, he was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in 2004, he received the Distinguished Achievement in the Humanities Award from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, amounting to one and a half million dollars. Random is at home in the tradition of pragmatism and analytical philosophy, but he sees himself also in significant ways as an heir to the rationalist school of thought as exemplified by Kant and Hegel, as Jürgen Habermas took note on the other side of the Atlantic soon after the publication in 1994 of Brandom's programmatic masterpiece, making it explicit. While working out the details of his normative pragmatism and inferentialist semantics, he also builds on Frege and Wittgenstein, and he argues with contemporary thinkers such as Davidson and Dummett, as well as his teachers, Sellers and Rorty. Following an anthology put together by Bernhard Weiss and Jeremy Wanderer, he might be the first to give a systematic and rigorous attempt to account for the meaning of linguistic items in terms of their socially norm-governed use, relying on a non-representationalist explanation of intentionality and rational pragmatics. A long list of books, articles, and conferences followed after making it explicit, as articulating reasons between saying and doing, 
from empiricism to expressivism, or vida erina de idealismus. It seems that Brandom is able to develop new thoughts and put them to print faster than many of us can read. A more comprehensive description of Brandom's life, work and interests may be found in the general introduction to the monograph where this interview has been published in written form. I will now ask Maria Jose Frappoli to say a few words in order to give a very general description of the philosophy Robert Brandom has developed. Thank you, Kurt, and hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Maria Jose Frappoli, and I'm going to interview Professor uh, Robert Brandon on the occasion of this uh, special issue of uh, Disputatio, devoted to the philosophy of Wittgenstein and Brandon. I don't know that um, what I'm going to do is um, giving a, an overview, because even a brief one would be something uh, extremely difficult. But um, I would like to, to say something. Uh, I would like to give you some clues about the main interests that have guided me in my choice of the question. Robert Brandon's contribution to contemporary philosophy, that we might call inferential pragmatism, is a complex combination of several intertwined theses, semantic inferentialism, logical and normative expressivism, methodological pragmatism, and normatic pragmatism. Many there are some others. The central aim of inferential pragmatism is understanding and explaining what it is for a creature to be rational and how the notion of conceptual content possessed by some of our acts, utterances, claims and expressions can be articulated. I don't think it is risky to say that the point of departure of Brandon's system is the idea that being consumers and producers of reasons, that is, being involved in actions with conceptual content, is what distinguishes us the ones who say we from other animals. In Brandon's uh, system, they converge different philosophical schools and streams of thought that have defined modern and contemporary philosophy, and uh, among others, and to focus on the 20th century, a substantial part of analytic philosophy and of American pragmatism flow into Brandon's system. Brandon has been enormously uh, generous in stressing at almost every step of uh, the development of his philosophy that he stands on the shoulders of giant. And he mentions Kant, Hegel, Frege, Wittgenstein, Dammet, Sellers, Rorty, Davison, and some others. But still, his proposal involves, as I said, a clear discontinuity with the standard approaches to language and normativity proper of the 20th century. Inferential pragmatism implies a reinterpretation of almost everything that is important in philosophy. In particular, many classical dichotomies in terms of art, familiar to all of us, become massively redefined. Some examples are the contrast between descriptive and normative, and also facts and norms, and his expressive approach to logical, epistemic, and semantic concepts, such as for instance, negation, conditional, knowledge, belief, truth, preference, etc. And in spite of this discontinuity that I have already mentioned, Brandon insists on the use of the old terms and the old dichotomies, together with some new ones, which might make it difficult to appreciate his proposal's radical tone. With this interview, I aim at understanding and testing the limits of Brandon's pragmatism, and getting clearer about the depth of his revolution in semantics and pragmatics, which I consider to be unrivaled in contemporary philosophy. Good morning, Professor Brandon. Hi, Bob. Uh, as you know, I have prepared 10 questions uh, divided into, into four groups. The first group is uh, metaphysics and anthropology. The second group, semantics and pragmatics. The third group um, is uh, epistemic expressivism. And the fourth group is um, uh, philosophy of logic. OK, so my first question, uh, my, my first question has two related parts. Uh, it's about the distinction between sapiens and sentience. So the question is whether the distinction between sapiens and sentience is, in classical terms, 
normative or descriptive, that is, whether it could be modified as the result of further developments in ethology, biology, or animal psychology, for instance. The point of my question is not whether uh, we are allowed to attribute conceptual contents to, to animals, to big apes, but whether given what, what we know now about the complexities of the of the communities in which they, they seem to, to use uh, norms and they, they seem to acknowledge the, the, the social status of different members of the group, given this situation, if you think that we could uh, say that in their communicative activities, they sort of entertain some kind of conceptual content. This is the first part. And the second part is whether the distinction between sapiens and sentience is absolute or admit fuzzy borders. Uh, the answer of this second part is uh, surely related to your kind of holism, because a moderate holism could allow, could, could allow a soft uh, a division and a gradual approach to the to the full category of sapiens, whereas a, a, a radical holism, a complete holism, would make the divide sharp. I would like to know what is your position at this point. Okay, there is a tension uh, methodologically in my work between uh, my pragmatism and my rationalism. The the pragmatism. Um, uh, generally counsels not making sharp distinctions, but uh, seeing intermediate cases, seeing uh, everything as uh, up for grabs uh, in principle. The rationalism, on the other hand, depends on uh, sort of making sharp distinctions, saying, look, this follows and this other doesn't. Uh, and, and there is a tension between these, but th this is one point on which uh, I'm a rationalist. I, I think of the line between sapience and non-sapience as a sharp, bright line. Uh, the, the question just is whether the practices or activities that the creatures in question engage in exhibit the right structure. Uh, and it's got to be a, it's a very complicated structure. Uh, uh, it's, uh, they have to engage in uh, norm-governed practices. They have to attribute to each other normative statuses and adopt normative attitudes towards one another. Uh, that's something uh, that I think uh, the more capable sorts of uh, non-human animals uh, are able to do. Uh, they, they can engage in um, uh, norm-governed activity. This is something uh, when, that I talked about at length with Michael Tomasello when he uh, visited at the University of Pittsburgh uh, for a year, and I think he's shown uh, the um, normative character of the interactions of some of the primates that he talks with. Uh, but the sort of structure that's needed for that norm-governed practice to be discursive practice is very complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's basically the one I describe in making it explicit. So for instance, it's not enough that creatures distinguish between what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. That is, those two uh, normative statuses. They have to distinguish between commitments and entitlements to two different kinds of normative status. And in particular, the question of whether one is entitled to a certain commitment has to be something that they can practically make sense of. Mm -hmm. uh, those statuses have to be inferentially articulated so that it has to be part of their practice that undertaking one commitment uh, has consequences for other commitments uh, consequences for what else you're entitled to, uh, that you have to distinguish between what would and what wouldn't entitle you to a particular commitment. Uh, so the commitments and entitlements have to be inheritable in these various um, uh, broadly inferential, uh, inferential ways, and they also have to be inheritable by testimony. Okay. Uh, so, so pragmatically, uh, 
what structure a set of implicitly normative social practices has to have to count as discursive practices, it's a very high bar. Uh, but it's also uh, a bright line. So, so I think there's no question that uh, non-human primates do not exhibit practices of the right sort of complexity to be discursive practices. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence that they keep separate track of commitments and entitlements okay. of the inheritance of them in the uh, in this inferentially articulated way. Uh, again, in these discussions with uh, Michael Tomasello, uh, he he agreed that the the sorts of things that he's seeing as proto-linguistic uh, among uh, chimpanzees, uh, for instance, uh, don't yet get into the territory that I count as uh, required for it to be genuinely linguistic, discursive uh, activity. Thank you very much. And uh, now my second question is more or less the same question, but at, um, at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, not about great apes, but about artificial intelligence, and so neural nets and supercomputers. The question, um, again, is whether you think that, the, that artificial neural nets can deal with some kind of conceptual content, and, as in the former question, whether the distinction between them and us is uh, so could be fuzzy or gradual and uh, could be modified as the result of, um, of some developments in computer sciences. But let me elaborate a little bit the context, focusing on three parts, on, on inferential semantics, on the socio-normative aspects, and on updating. I think that the, the justification of the level of inferential semantics seems to be easier. So because we say that computers make inferences, that they can draw a conclusion from premises and so on and so forth, and at every step, the program determines the steps which are reachable. And we might understand this reachability as the entitlement, for instance, and the step of derivation that are precluded. So there is a sense in which we could individuate information by its place in an inferential network. Less natural is to identify the socio-normative aspects that would justify the attribution to computers of normative statuses, of course. But nevertheless, we can think of groups of interconnected uh, computers, neural nets, server farms, as units that exchange information, that give and take information from other uh, computers and also from uh, uh, human users. And uh, I'm sure that the algorithms uh, could detect the relative reliability of different sources and also sort of uh, uh, recognize the authority of some sources, for instance, the, the authority of their programming, uh, programmers because they use uh, the password, some password, to intervene in the system. And uh, uh, the third aspect is uh, learning or updating. If I understood you correctly, I think that your, your criticism in between saying and doing against the whole project of artificial intelligence um, has to do with, this, with your impression that computers are not sensitive to contextual information. But it seems that currently experts in computing and, and neural um, nets seem to think, to think otherwise. A standard negative answer, of course, would appeal to consciousness or something like that, but uh, you have rejected this kind of answer uh, for the cases of the parrot and the thermostat, and for good reasons. So, what is your your point here? Because in this case, the neural uh, nets, this case, uh, they do have the, the much more complexity probably than uh, than communities of um, great apes. What is your opinion? Yes, well, uh, as you suggested, one of the uh, consequences of sharply distinguishing sapience from sentience is to reject uh, the sort of argument that John Searle has made that uh, artificial intelligence without sentience is unintelligible. Uh, I, th that's what I take the, the basis of the uh, appeals to consciousness to be, uh, that they're thinking, no, sentience is an essential presupposition of sapience, 
And as, as you point out, I reject that. Mm -hmm. And so in, in principle for me, there is no reason uh, why electronic computers could not be discursive creatures. Uh, the, the, the mere fact that they're not biological organisms does not entail that uh, for me. Uh, there's two questions uh, that I think it's important to, to separate. One is whether a computer could become uh, a practitioner, a participant in our discursive practices. Uh, and the second is whether uh, a group of computers or uh, a group of interacting programs within one physical machine, that doesn't make a difference, but whether they could interact in such a way as to be, uh, as to confer propositional and conceptual content on the messages they sent uh, back and forth to each other, independently of any interaction with us. That is, could they do what we do in that sense, in, uh, in the sense that their practices were sufficient to confer meanings, to institute uh, conceptually contentful discursive statuses. Uh, so, so that's a, a much more challenging question than the question of whether they could come to be uh, participants in our practices that is uh, able to use um, expressions that, that we had made meaningful, even though the computer wasn't capable of making it um, meaningful. Uh, and uh, I don't see um, uh, reasons in principle why either of those uh, is impossible. Okay. Uh, now, I do think that the most challenging uh, barrier to get over uh, in doing this is uh, the non-monotonic character of our reasoning. Uh, the, the way in which um, though a certain inference may be good, when we're given a new piece of information, that may make the inference no longer uh, no longer good. Uh, in, in the largest uh, uh, sense, I think this is what the discussion within computer science of the frame problem uh, has been getting at. Uh, in order to uh, reason and so to think, one has to ignore a lot of things that are going on, a lot of beliefs uh, that one has. Uh, precisely because the inferences that matter are non-monotonic. So one has to not be worried about the possibility of infirming additional premises until and unless they're ac actually brought out onto the table to be discussed. Uh, strange as it may seem, this capacity to ignore potentially relevant considerations until they become actually relevant. That capacity not to pay attention to things, but to not pay attention to things, that's very difficult to, to implement in a way that will allow one to reason in the proper non-monotonic way. We don't have good formal representations of the non-monotonicity of material inference. And this, I think, is the, the biggest technical challenge to getting computers either to be able to participate uh, as full-fledged members of our of our discursive communities or uh, us programming them to be able to form their own communities which would confer uh, confer content now I said I thought the the first of those was easier uh, the computers already are, second-class members of our discursive community. We can use them uh, for all sorts of helpful purposes, um, and surely that's going to uh, continue apace. Uh, 
uh, just using them uh, and their recognitional capacities to extend our senses, treating them as reporters of phenomena. Uh, th this is already uh, something we've made uh, great strides with. Uh, I do think it, it's important to temper our enthusiasm for the uh, neural network form, the, the deep learning form of artificial intelligence. It's been, it's been very exciting because that, that form of parallel distributed processing, when combined with big data, has turned out to be able to address topics uh, and, and solve problems that uh, classical von Neumann architectures that require uh, explicit programming and uh, formulation of rules uh, were very bad at. Yeah. On the other hand, it's not clear to me that these uh, issue that the issues that arise from the non-monotonicity of material inference, it's not clear to me that those issues are well addressed by uh, the neural network uh, pattern. It it remains to be seen. Maybe so, in which case exciting things will happen soon. But uh, it's possible that that just isn't a problem of the right shape uh, for them to be good at. Um, but, you know, I think we don't understand the structure of our own capacities in that regard well enough to be able to say. But the fact that, you know, the computers are machines with on-off switches and so on, this does not preclude them from, uh, that's not the problem. Okay, this is the second part on semantics and pragmatics, and I, I think that the, that the questions here are easier or quicker. The third, my third question is, uh, as a pragmatist, you support the logical and chronological priority of propositions over concepts, uh, which derives from the central status of the, that assertion language downtown has in linguistic practice, and also because you are a pragmatist, the dichotomy between semantics versus pragmatics is no longer a basic distinction in your view, even though you make a profuse methodological use of it. The preeminent state of that assertion has, in your view, has made some uh, authors, I'm thinking of Hugh Price, accuse you of some kind of monism, uh, which contrasts with the, the uh, pluralism attributed to Wittgenstein. So my, my question is, in your view, uh, so do you, you consider, do you consider, uh, consider your view monist from a semantic or pragmatic point of view? And uh, if the answer is affirmative, in which sense? And if it is monist, how your monist could uh, account for the obvious plurality of uh, speech acts? Uh -huh. Well, this is another area where uh, my pragmatism and my rationalism are in a certain uh, are in a certain tension. Uh, Wittgenstein has uh, uh, the, the picture of languages being a motley. There are many things we can do with it. Uh, it's not just that uh, there aren't uh, uh, a small number of speech acts we can perform. It's an indefinitely extensible uh, uh, pragmatics that he sees, language as a motley. Uh, Whereas I have uh, what I think is fairly called a, a monistic view, at least at base. Uh, I think what makes something a discursive practice is that you can say something in it in the sense of making an assertion. Uh, anything is a discursive practice if in that practice you can say that things are thus and so. Uh, as I said, that's what's required to uh, confer that content uh, on some speech act to, to make it, uh, uh, in the proper sense, a speech act, a claiming. That's very complicated, but uh, that's necessary and sufficient for something to be a discursive practice uh, in my understanding. Uh, all the other speech acts I'm committed to understanding uh, as a superstructure that we can make sense of ultimately in terms of our capacity to, to assert. Uh, 
to claim that things are thus and so. So, for instance, if we think about uh, the slab schwachspiel that Wittgenstein opens the investigations with, in my sense, uh, a vocal game, but not really a verbal game. Uh, it, it's not a language game, uh, properly so-called, because the commands that are given in it uh, are not orders. They're uh, vocalizations that are appropriately responded to by, for instance, bringing, by doing something, by, for instance, bringing a slab. But to be an order, uh, it's not enough to be a, an act or a performance that's appropriately responded to in some ways and not in others. It has to be that by saying what it's appropriately, how it's appropriate to respond to it. You can't say, shut the door, unless you can say, the door is shut. Uh, you have to be able to assert that things are thus and so for some speech act to have the significance of commanding someone to make things uh, thus and so. Uh, similarly for questions, uh, you have to be able to give the answers in order to understand, uh, understand questions. Proper semantics of questions, I think, is a matter of uh, what, the, what are responsive answers to uh, different kinds uh, of questions. So uh, I've undertaken the, the very strong commitment that uh, I can make sense, I claim to be able to make sense of discursive practices that only have assertions uh, in them. And I'm committed to making sense of all the other things you can do with language. Uh, as something that, that we can understand is built out of uh, and built on top of the capacity to make those uh, to make those assertions. I think of this as good Papirian methodology, uh, make the strongest, most easily falsifiable claim that's compatible with you know what what you know is true. Uh, this is how we will make progress. Uh, I would not be surprised to have people show me that uh, you've got to have some other basic uh, speech acts uh, involved as well. I'm really pretty confident that no one's going to show that you don't need assertion to, uh, to be in the game, but that you might need a lot more uh, than that. Uh, I don't, I make the stronger claim because I don't see what the others are needed for, but I'm entirely open to, to finding that out, as I say, in the spirit of Popper. Uh. Okay, thank you. And, uh, okay, um, my fourth question is uh, the following. Um, in the notion of correct material inference that lies at the core of your inferential uh, semantics, there is, as I see it, no room for a principal distinction between descriptive and normative terms a distinction on which the bifurcation, bifurcation thesis, as used by, by Rorty and Price, for instance, rests. The thesis that there is a strict line to be drawn between descriptive and non-descriptive terms, or uses of terms, as Price uh, prefers to say. Your normative pragmatism also assumes that normative notions, commitment and entitlements, are more fundamental than non-normative ones, which goes, in my opinion, again, against the classical intuition that support the bifurcation thesis. Instead, your approach of the of the uh, sorry, uh, your approach to the meaning of normative terms makes use of a different dichotomy, because your normative expressivism needs the distinction between ground level contents in material inferences and the expression of attitudes towards uh, normative statuses and inferential connections, which is done by means of higher level expressive terms. Now the question, do you think that the standard formulation of the bifurcation thesis uh, should uh, say something interesting? Do you think that we should uh, keep this, uh, this uh, bifurcation thesis? And uh, uh, if uh, the, the, uh, the answer is uh, affirmative, well, what would you say uh, that it is the, the relationship between this, the classical bifurcation thesis and your distinction between 
ground level and expressive terms? So, I mean, I think it's uh, entirely compatible with a broadly Wittgensteinian pragmatism, uh, which sees uh, expressions as playing quite different expressive roles. Nonetheless, to try and say uh, accurately and insofar as possible systematically what those expressive roles are. Mm. So one of the things I always found frustrating uh, in reading the investigations was Wittgenstein's well-taken uh, examples to uh, make us realize that uh, not every use of declarative sentences is in the fact-stating line of work, that not every use of singular terms is in the object referring uh, line of work. Uh, I thought all those points are well taken. I wanted him to tell me more about what the fact stating line of work is. What is it to use a singular term as purporting to pick out uh, a particular object? Okay, maybe uh, pain talk doesn't do that, but doesn't do what? exactly. Uh, and, and that's the sort of question that I uh, set out to begin, at least begin to answer in uh, making it explicit. Uh, so when I look at the different expressive roles that uh, vocabularies can play, it seems to me there are a number of uh, quite different ones. In particular, uh, Kant, I think, was the first one to realize that besides concepts whose basic use and expressive function is to describe and explain empirical goings-on, there are other concepts whose principal expressive role it is to make explicit features of the framework that makes it possible to describe and explain. And oh, chief among the vocabularies that have that different framework explicating role, I think, are a lethic modal uh, vocabulary that's making explicit the subjunctive robustness of material reasoning on the one hand, and normative vocabulary uh, on the other hand. The normative vocabulary that I see as making explicit our commitment our endorsement of, our commitment to the goodness of, our endorsement of patterns of practical reasoning. Uh, and it seems to me that it's uh, the distinction between um, theoretical and practical reasoning, that is reasoning whose conclusion is something assertable on the mm -hmm. one hand, and uh, reasoning whose conclusion is straight way to do something, as uh, uh, Aristotle more or less says, that is to perform some uh, uh, action which is not uh, basically a claiming. Uh, and I see the distinctive expressive role of normative vocabulary being to uh, endorse patterns of practical reasoning. Uh, so the different senses of ought, uh, for instance, the uh, prudential or instrumental use of ought, the social practical use, and maybe a moral use, all correspond to different, to endorsing different patterns of practical reasoning. So it seems to me a pragmatist can distinguish theoretical from practical reasoning by distinguishing assertions from other things. Uh, and then it's more or less a, a question of fact. Do we use normative vocabulary to uh, express the goodness of, or at least to endorse the goodness of patterns of practical reasoning? Uh, and if that is something we do with it, is that function sufficient to distinguish normative vocabulary as such? And I think the answer to those questions is yes. So, so I think it's a mistake to assimilate uh, 
what we're doing when we use normative vocabulary to fact stating, to, to saying how the world is. Uh, that's not to say that uh, there can't be any fact stating role for normative vocabulary, but that's not the home language game uh, of normative vocabulary. Okay. And uh, so, um, deeply related to, to this question is uh, the following, the, the, my fifth question, which is, as it happens with uh, other classical dichotomies, your use of fact and factual versus norm and normative is non-standard. Facts are true claims, and what it is to be a fact has to be explained in normative terms. Then, if fact is a normative notion, the notion of fact, fact is normative, what is the relevance of the standard distinction between factual and normative meaning, if any? So it's, it's, an, it's, it's a different way of looking at the same problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so I... Uh, have an extremely relaxed and elastic notion of fact, yeah. um, uh, which simply reflects uh, the notion of assertion. So uh, uh, to be assertable is to be, in the broadest sense, in the fact-stating line of work. Uh, a fact is a true claim, claim in the sense of true claimable, not, not yeah. in the sense of a true, of a true claiming. Uh, and so to understand the notion of fact, one has to understand uh, claimability, uh, which one can't understand without understanding what one's doing in claiming something. Uh, one can't understand what one's doing in claiming something in non-normative terms. Uh, claiming is undertaking a commitment. So one is not going to understand uh, claimables without understanding claimings, and that's a, uh, a normative notion. Uh, so sort of behind our uh, descriptions of the empirical world uh, are non-normative claims. Uh, there is this normative pragmatics. What we're doing in making those claims has to be understood in uh, normative uh, in normative terms. Okay, thank you. And uh, then the last um, the last question of this block. Okay, so semantic inferentialism is essentially holistic. In order to possess one concept, one has to possess many. Semantic holism has been standardly criticized for the risk it involves of making communication impossible. You answer this criticism by stressing the role of anaphora in the task of securing the stability of contents. Now, we are here in front of another radical dichotomy, the dichotomy between semantic atomism that you reject and complete holism that seems that you seem to, to embrace. So you have... Uh, uh, you seem to have weakened your semantic holism, introducing the idea of the robustness of some material inferences. As I see it, radical holism is a very strong thesis that, that, to my mind, you don't need, and that cannot be founded on our real practices. And I will insist on this point uh, in, in my last question. Could you explain what is your kind of holism? whether radical and complete or gradual and moderate? This is a very complicated uh, issue, and there's at least three things I'd like to say about it. Uh, the first is uh, Sellers, uh, my inspiration for the inferentialism, uh, said uh, that only some of the inferences that a concept is, is involved with are semantically constitutive of uh, that uh, content. Uh, it's all and only the counterfactual, counterfactually robust, the counterfactual supporting inferences that uh, are um, uh, essential to the uh, to the content of the concept. 
Um, and he accept so in the title of one of his essays, Concepts as Involving Laws and Inconceivable Without Them, uh, he, he thought of that subjunctive robustness of the inferences as underwritten by laws. And so it's only where it's only the laws that articulate the concepts that are um, uh, semantically essential. Now, I think that was uh, a perfectly intelligible response to the total holism that says uh, that uh, all the inferences that uh, a bit of vocabulary are involved in are equally essential to its uh, vocabulary. So I was saying, no, only some of them, only these uh, counterfactual supporting uh, inferences are uh, essential to it. And I don't think that uh, subjunctive robustness always traces back to some law uh, underlying things. I think uh, statements of laws are limiting cases of subjunctive robustness, which is a, uh, a ubiquitous phenomenon of material inference. That is, I make a certain inference, I say it's raining so the streets uh, will be wet. Uh, now, it, it's an important part of understanding that, that I have some view about the range of subjunctive robustness of that inference, that uh, if people had built awnings over the roads, it wouldn't go through, but uh, uh, you know, if it's Tuesday, that isn't going to infirm the uh, isn't going to infirm the inference. Uh, I think uh, that the right way to think about it is in terms of ranges of subjunctive robustness. That every inference is robust under some addition, additional premises, and outside of uh, mathematics and sort of fundamental physics, uh, where the reasoning is mathematical, that uh, no inferences are universally subjunctively robust. That is, all of them have some conditions of defeasibility. That's a matter of more or less. So uh, I don't think that Seller's criterion draws a bright line and says, oh, only these inferences uh, are part of the meaning, these others are not. I would rather say that the uh, ranges of subjunctive robustness are part of what you need to master in order to master uh, the use uh, of a concept, but that's a more or less, uh, uh, a matter of more or less, not, uh, again, a bright line. So, so that's one point. Second point is that the people who see um, uh, semantic holism as potentially a threat to the intelligibility of communication are not thinking in normative terms. Uh, they're thinking uh, about our dispositions to make inferences and are saying, well, because you have different collateral beliefs than I do, uh, just because we uh, carve out different trajectories through the world, uh, because we have different uh, collateral beliefs, we're going to be disposed to endorse different inferences, and so they think mean different things according to the holistic principle. But uh, meanings are not a matter of our dispositions, they're a matter of the norms that we bind ourselves by. You and I can bind ourselves by exactly the same norms when we say the coin is copper, even though your conception of what you're committing yourself to by saying it's copper may be very different from mine, and neither of us understands what we're really committing ourselves to as well as the metallurgist does. Uh, those norms that we're binding ourselves by, those could be uh, completely holistic in a, in a radical sense. And it wouldn't keep you and me from communicating with each other as long as we're binding ourselves by the same norms. Okay. That's the second point. The third point is, um, but it, it seems to me that the notion of conceptual content is a ladder that we should climb up and then throw away 
uh, after we've climbed up on it, uh, to use Wittgenstein's uh, metaphor, that uh, the practical capacities to understand each other that we have are navigating between your conception of what you're committing yourself to by saying the coin is copper and mine. Uh, I need to be able to extract information from your remark. You're looking at the coin and I'm not. And I say, tell me about it. You say it's copper. Well, I need to be able to use your claim as a premise in my reasoning. Uh, and, and for that, the fact that you've bound yourself by this public norm in playing the counter, copper, using the English word copper, that tells me a lot about uh, what inferences I can uh, make from it. But uh, I'm going to appeal to sort of everything I know about the world and about you uh, in order to, to make the practical judgment as to which of the things that I would take to follow if I were calling something copper are actually conclusions that I can draw from your calling it uh, copper. This is a practical capacity to navigate between our different doxastic uh, perspectives. And we're both committed to their, as I would say, to their being something that copper means, some norm that we've bound ourselves by. Uh, but it isn't actually that much help in the practical navigation. But what we want to do is understand that practical capacity. For instance, if, uh, the, if a computer is going to get to be even a second class interlocutor with us, not only do we have to be able to make inferences from its utterances, which we can already do pretty well, we sort of know what's behind the uh, utterance of the computer or, you know, Google when it tells me the uh, answer to some, its answer to some uh, question. But it's also going to have to be able to make this judgment. What inferences can it make from the things that we've said? That practical capacity to navigate between the perspectives. That's what's required for communication. And it's not clear to me why people think that, for instance, thinking of a proposition as a partition of an uncountably infinite universe of possible worlds into those in which the proposition is true and those in which it's not, why does that make it more intelligible that you and I can navigate uh, across this gap when you say the coin is is copper? Uh, So this is the third, the third block, epistemic expressivism. Um, epistemic concepts express attitudes toward normative statuses, either belonging to the speaker or attributed to a third party. The difference in the normative attitude to, statu uh, to statuses entertained or attributed in attributions of knowledge and, be and beliefs accounts for the difference in meaning between these two concepts. Attributing knowledge to someone is attributing to her a commitment and an entitlement to this commitment and undertaking oneself the commitment to the content, which means taking the content as true. By contrast, by contrast in the attribution of belief, the attributor doesn't undertake the commitment to the content and she doesn't need to take the content as true, even though this is not excluded. Now, let us focus on first person assertions. Assertions are a way of expressing beliefs, and beliefs are the content of assertions. At the same time, you claim that placing assertion at the center of the linguistic practice that institutes significances and confers content is, I quote, to treat the sort of claim involved in asserting as an implicit knowledge claim. All these things together, together mean that assertion are implicit knowledge claims in which beliefs are expressed. If we combine the roles of knowledge and belief with what you say about assertion, it follows that there is a sense in which an agent cannot distinguish between his assertion that he believes that P, his assertion that he knows that P, his assertion that P is true, and sorry, and his assertion that P is true because in all these cases there is a commitment to P and there must be at least a presumption of entitlement 
for this assertion to be successful. The result at this, at this point is something like a semantic or pragmatic version of the Gettier's insight that the agent cannot distinguish between the circumstances in which he is entitled to assert knowledge and the circumstances that authorize him to merely claim belief. And the same goes for the con uh, consequences he is committed to by his assertion of knowledge and belief. You are aware of this consequence uh, of your specialist account of epistemic concept. My question is, if the meaning of knowledge and belief can only be seen in third-person attributions, what is the role of those first-person claims that include epistemic terms? In particular, do you think that epistemic terms in first and third-person claims have the same meaning? Well, same meaning is not one of my words. <laughs> yeah, I, know. Uh, I mean, I think they're first and third person versions of uh, uh, one claim, and the, it's essential to the terms like knowledge and belief, uh, meaning what they do, that they have both first and third uh, person uses that are related in just the way they're related. So, um, uh, Maybe an example would be uh, that there's a sense in which when when I say something, I am confused. Uh, and when you utter the same words, uh, there's a sense in which we're expressing the same thought and a sense in which we're not. Uh, and when I say, when you say, uh, meaning to be a same-sayer with me, uh, you're confused. I've said I'm confused. Uh, we can say, well, do those two statements have the same meaning, or are they just intimately related in what they mean in such a way that we can understand both of them? And I don't think in the end it matters which of those we say, as long as we can describe the practices. So that's basically what you've uh, asked me to do here. Uh, for the case of, uh, let's just say, knowledge and belief. Uh, and I think we can uh, uh, address the question uh, uh, along two fronts, uh, pragmatic force and semantic content. So uh, you've, you've got me quite right in uh, thinking that uh, knowledge and belief, what, what you're doing in attributing uh, knowledge and belief is distinguishable only in the third person, uh, only in the third person uh, case. Uh, the fact that, that uh, to learn to use these words, one needs to learn the third person use uh, means that one has that available in one's own case crucially to talk about one's past beliefs. So I, I can, in my in a first-person case, say, look, I used to believe uh, that copper had a higher melting point than aluminum, but now I know that it uh, doesn't. That's basically a third-person attitude towards my own beliefs because it's not my current, uh, my current uh, beliefs. But because I'm... Uh, able to take up that third person point of view and make the distinction to other people, I can make it in, in my own case too. And because I can do it for my past, uh, for my past commitments, that's what makes it possible for me to entertain the possibility that uh, though I believe it, it might not be true. What I'm doing is imagining my future self being in this position with respect to my present self. So this is all at the level of force. Uh, but there's a level of, at the level of content, uh, I can distinguish really quite apart from uh, the considerations I was just rehearsing. When I have the expressive resources to make ascriptions, including first person ascriptions, of belief and knowledge explicit. Uh, so ascribing them, not just attributing them, uh, as I use the terms in 
making it explicit. Now we can see a difference between uh, P, the, the claim that P, uh, the claim I believe that P, and the claim I know that P. But let me just talk about uh, the claim, the coin is copper, and I believe that the coin is copper. And we say, well, to grasp the content of those claims is to know what follows from them and what's incompatible with them. Uh, but very different things are incompatible with the claim the coin is made of copper and the claim I believe that the coin is made of copper. Uh, for instance, random never existed is incompatible with the claim I believe that the coin is copper, but it's not incompatible with the claim the coin is copper. Uh, so those two claims, the coin is copper and I believe that the coin is copper, those have very different meanings for me. Different things follow from them, different things are incompatible uh, with them. So even at the level of content, uh, when I look at I believe that P and uh, I know that P, well, from I know that P, it follows that P. If I know that the coin is copper, it follows that the coin is copper. It doesn't follow from I believe that the coin is copper, that the coin is copper. Uh, different, as I say, different things are incompatible, different things follow. So these uh, different epistemic statuses uh, are distinguishable in the level of force, but they're distinguishable in the level of content uh, as well. And uh, in the second half of the eighth chapter of making it explicit, uh, I show that the way I've introduced uh, explicit ascriptions uh, confers different con inferential roles on them than uh, for all ascriptions uh, than any of the underlying claims. Uh, so that even though it's a social practice account of what you're doing in claiming, uh, it confers content on those claims that isn't equivalent to the content of any claims about what anybody believes. Okay, so and uh, related uh, to this question, um, just uh, I'm thinking of Ramsey. So a possible answer to the previous question is to acknowledge that terms such as knowledge and belief are ambiguous, sort of between, an, let's say, an absolute semantic pragmatic sense used to make explicit attitudes on the one hand, and a, let's say, psychological sense in which they represent something like Ramseyan degrees of belief, whose function might be expressing the subjective confidence of the agent in his reasons of or evidence. Would you be prepared to accept this uh, alternative meaning for first-person epistemic claims? If so, how would you say that the two senses, the semantic pragmatic proper of attributions and the psychological related to first-person claims are related? Of course, officially, belief is not one of my words. Commitment uh, is. Uh, and I don't think of commitment as coming in degrees. Uh, it seems to me that what uh, the Ramsian talk about degrees of belief uh, is the phenomenon that it's trying to capture is the phenomenon that I uh, referred to earlier under the rubric range of subjunctive robustness of an inference. So, uh, you know, when I make a claim, let's say as the conclusion of an inference, I'm aware that there are many things that could infirm the inference that I met, uh, that I that I made. Uh, I have not surveyed, made a study of all of the potential defeasers so that I can say, and look, I know that none of those defeasers uh, hold. Uh, I think of the, uh, what Ramsey is trying to express by saying, well, I'm not very confident in this belief. I have a certain, uh, I have only a certain small degree of belief in it, uh, is 
trying to cover with, uh, trying to represent with real numbers between zero and one, uh, this much more complicated algebraic situation in which the inferential procedure that led me to this conclusion is defeasible by lots of other things that could be, uh, that could turn out to be true. Uh, I think what we need to do is get a better way of representing than we have now those ranges of subjunctive robustness, uh, which I'm acknowledging when I say, well, when I use a Ceteris Paribus clause or uh, say, look, this is the conclusion I draw, but it might not, it might not be right. Uh, I'm really acknowledging that I haven't looked into all the possible defeating uh, circumstances and ruled them out. And I'd rather talk about that actual range of possible defeaters uh, rather than uh, put a probability or credence uh, measure uh, on something. So I think there's a real phenomenon there, but degrees of belief is giving it the wrong algebraic structure. And, and we have uh, just uh, two questions uh, left on philosophy of logic. And uh, so my, my, my first question uh, about philosophy of logic uh, is the following. I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested in the effect of considering inference a more basic notion than truth in the philosophy of logic. So in the philosophy of logic, there is a basic distinction between valid arguments, those in which the conclusion is a necessary consequence of premises, and sound arguments, those valid arguments with true premises. In semantic inferentialism, the notion of inference is more basic than the notion of truth. Being taken as true is being usable as a premise and or being the conclusion of a correct material inference. Naturally, we must maintain the difference between being true or being correct and being taken as true or as correct, as Wittgenstein stressed. But this, as I see it, uh, this can only be done from the third person perspective in which the attributor expresses her attitude towards the commitments and entitlements of the subject who is ca uh, carrying on an inference. An attributor can reject an inference endorsed by a third party for several reasons. For instance, she might see that the attributee is entitled to his commitment with his, with his premises without being committed, committed herself to them. And uh, she can reject the normative connection between premises and conclusions by rejecting that commitment to the premises and titles the commitment to the conclusion. So all this is clear. There is no problem here. Nevertheless, in the realm of logic, the contrast between first and third person perspective disappears. We might, again, in a Ramsayan vein, distinguish degre degrees of assertive character. That is, we might support some premises merely as conjectures only to see what follows from them, or on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, as something about which the subject is absolutely sure, etc. But I cannot see how this gradation could be projected into the realm of logic. Do you think that do you think that within the realm of logical theory the distinction between valid and sound inferences is a relevant one? And if so, how could inferentialism explain it? Okay. Uh, so, Dummett had already argued that it was a mistake to think of logic in terms of truth as the study of a distinctive kind of truth, logical truth, uh, that the traditional understanding of logic as the study of consequence uh, was surely the correct one. And he points to the fact that uh, we're familiar with some, uh, we're familiar with logics that have the same set of theorems, but different consequence relations. And we think of them as different logics uh, in, in that case. Uh, and, and I think he's perfectly right about that. But Dummett goes on to uh, characterize logic as the study of a particular kind of consequence, namely logical consequence. And 
I think that's wrong. Uh, I don't think uh, logic is the study of logical uh, inference, and I don't think that it's a canon of right reasoning for any inferences. Uh, I think that logic is uh, the study of the use uh, of vocabulary to make inferences explicit. Uh, that is, a vocabulary that has this distinctive expressive role of letting us reason about reasoning. Uh, but it, its job is not to tell us of this non-logical reasoning, which it's uh, helping us express. Its job is not to tell us which of those are good and which aren't. Uh, its job is just to let us make explicit, make claimable, assertable uh, claims about what follows from what and what's incompatible with what. That's why I think the conditional and negation are the fundamental log bits of logical vocabulary, the conditional that lets us talk about uh, inferential uh, consequence relations, and negation that lets us talk about incompatib material incompatibilities uh, uh, of things. Uh, the distinction between uh, logically valid reasoning and reasoning that isn't logically valid doesn't come up for ground level material inferences. Uh, what we have there is the distinction, as you suggested in your question, between uh, counterfactual reasoning, uh, reasoning where I say, well, uh, I'm reasoning under supposition, yeah. where I'm not endorsing uh, the premises, I'm exploring them. Let, let's see what uh, one would be committing oneself to if uh, uh, one were to assert uh, uh, this claim. I think that distinction between uh, reasoning under supposition, uh, uh, counterfactual reasoning and on the one hand, and uh, uh, reasoning where one endorses the premises and uh, may or may not endorse the conclusion because some uh, material reasoning is permissive rather than uh, committive. But in any case, where one endorses the, uh, the distinction between reasoning where one endorses the premises and reasoning where there doesn't, where one doesn't, that's a real distinction at the ground level. Uh, I, I know you, Maria, uh, remember that uh, Frege claimed that you couldn't make inferences from premises that one didn't regard as true. Sure. Uh, that, that what one was doing in that case was considering true conditionals that had uh, the apparent premises as the antecedents, uh, as the antecedents of them. Uh, I think that it's at the level of conditionals that we see what's common to uh, counterfactual reasoning and indicative uh, reasoning because we can formulate both of them in the form of conditionals and look at the different uh, behavior of those uh, uh, of those conditionals. Uh, I don't think that the principal philosophical interest of logic is in logically good inferences. For me, those are just the inferences that articulate the inferential roles of logical vocabulary. But what's important about the logical vocabulary is not so much its inferential role as its expressive role with yeah. respect to non-logical uh, vocabulary. So I'm not much interested in logical consequence relations. I'm interested in the logical expression of material consequence relations. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, my last question is uh, about um, the principle, the, this uh, principle espoused broadly. In a, in a recent paper commenting the book of Jarda Peregrin, you reject the classical principle of explosion, as, uh, also known as expulso quod libet and consequentia mirabilis. Uh, the principle says that uh, from materially inconsistent premises, everything follows. The principle is completely alien to a pragmatist approach to logic and semantics, and your rejection of the principle is uh, really passionate. 
you consider the principle not only false, but an embarrass embarrassment for teachers, proper of televangelists. <laughs> I quite agree. And affirm that, I quote, it corresponds to nothing whatsoever in ordinary reasoning, that it's a pure artifact of classical logical machinery. Your position is the much reasonable one that from an inconsistent set of premises follows what follows from each one of its members and nothing else. And I agree. Nevertheless, you seem to accept a version of it proposed by one of your former students uh, Ulf Lobel, I, I don't know how to pronounce uh, his name, Exfal, Exfixo Falso Quod Libet, EFFQ. The difference is that in, in this new version, EFFQ, the premise set is explicitly contradictory. That is, it contains A and not A. And thus, not only it, but also every subset of it is inconsistent. Now, I cannot see the gain of including uh, this new principle, EFFQ, among our, lo uh, our logical principles, neither from a logical nor a pragmatist per perspective. I cannot see why you don't apply to this case what you say about the classical principle, that is, that from contradictory premises follows what fro follows from one of them and from this negation and nothing else. Logical constants, negation included, have expressive meaning. They do not add any substantive information, but their role is making explicit some attitude. Then my question, there are three related questions. Why the explicit representation of an implicit incompatibility changes the status of the classical principle? The second one is, which would be those ordinary inferential practices that would correspond to the new principle, to EFFQ? And the third, in the connection with my former question number six, radical semantic holism implies that A is inferentially related to everything that is not incompatible with it, and the same happens with this negation. Then A and not A together exhaust the logical space in the Einsteinian terminology. Nevertheless, methodological pragmatism states that semantics must answer to pragmatics. So if the, the classical principle, ex falso quod libet, corresponds, in your words, to nothing whatsoever in ordinary reasoning, as you say, the same fate should run its stronger principle, its a stronger uh, new version. If we discovered that there is no ordinary practice that supports the new version, would you consider that this would be a reason against a radical version of semantic holism? Good question. Uh, and it's quite possible that in uh, the argument in the paper that you uh, uh, premise your question on, uh, that I was misleading about uh, the rhetorical situation, what I was taking for granted and uh, what not. Uh, that is, uh, my own view is that uh, nothing about logical consequence actually reflects anything about material consequence. That's not the level at which there's an, uh, uh, at which logical, is, logical vocabulary is expressive of uh, non-logical reasoning. Uh, it's logical claims that have to correspond, that is claims made in a uh, logically extended language, a language you've added logical vocabulary to, those claims explicitly codify features of basic reasoning. Uh, the logical consequence relations just articulate the inferential roles of the logical vocabulary. In ordinary practice, we don't use logical vocabulary, and so there isn't anything in our ordinary practice that uh, they're answering to. Now, I was addressing my argument to the legit, to the teacher of logic who is lying to their undergraduates and saying, look, I'm going to teach you to reason better by teaching you formal logic. Uh, and, and so is thinking that somehow behind every good inference, materially good inference, there's a logically good inference, a logically valid inference hidden somewhere in there. And their picture is, and I'm going to find that, I'm going to teach you how to find that, and you'll be a better reasoner. Uh, 
And now they say, oh, and by the way, if you have incompatible uh, claims, uh, then everything follows from it. Well, from your point of view, from, from what you're claiming logical logic is doing, think of it as a canon of right reasoning, thinking of good reasons as meaning, logically good reasons, you ought to be embarrassed uh, by that because that, uh, you know, that, that's not codifying anything about uh, ordinary reasoning. Now, the specific uh, context in which uh, ex fixo falso quad libet uh, comes up is uh, we're thinking, uh, we're using logic to codify non-monotonic uh, material uh, consequence relations. And so when we have materially incompatible uh, premise sets, uh, it's entirely possible that that uh, incompatibility, that the incoherence of that premise set is curable by adding further premises, you may end up with something that actually is coherent. Uh, that's not going to happen if you say that the, if you accept explosion of the uh, of the consequences. Well, when could you accept that? Well, the strongest thing in the vicinity one could accept is if the material incompatibility you got is incurable. If nothing that you added into it as further premises would yield a coherent premise set, well, then it doesn't matter what uh, you take to follow from it. You're not going to be able to reason uh, with it. Whereas if it's curable, well, then we better keep track of what, uh, uh, what materially follows from it. So the EFFQ is a sort of don't care. Those cases you can have... Uh, explosion, if you like, and this had the advantage that uh, the system collapses to uh, classical logic if the underlying uh, material consequence relation is monotonic and you only look at uh, implications that are persistent, that is, that uh, continue to hold no matter what else you throw in with them. So in our logical system, we introduce a modal operator uh, that says, uh, if from a premise set you can conclude A indefeasibly, so that no matter what else you added to, to the premise set, it would still follow, then we say, well, it's not just A that follows, but box A. You know, A follows persistently from it. Uh, and uh, classical logic turns out to be the modal fragment of this larger, of this larger logic. So it's a technical convenience to have EFFQ in it, but I don't uh, assign any particular philosophical significance okay. to it. It's okay. just something. It's just something we can put up with. Thank you very much, and that's all on my part. So, thank you, thank you for your for your answer. It has been very illuminating, and I have learned a lot. And uh, now, uh, Vishin, uh, who is the, the guest editor of this issue of this Putatio, uh, wanted to to ask you other two questions, if it is possible. I'm, I'm by no means as knowledgeable about your philosophy as Maria Jose. She, uh, she just introduced me to your philosophy some two years ago. I'm more <laughs> some sort I tried. of... <laughs> I tried. Well, <laughs> if I fail, it's my failure. Um, <laughs> I, I'm more of an old-fashioned Wittgensteinian, and, and that paints my question to you. I will skip the first two, I think, Maria Jose sent you, and I will just make the last one about uh, the philosophical quietism or semantical nihilism you address in the in the new article you wrote for essentially for our our review some strands of Wittgenstein's normative pragmatism and some strains of his semantic nihilism uh, essentially in this article you say that there is one argument that is very shallow 
that says that Wittgenstein is an anti-scientism and that he is against using uh, theoretical terms in an ontological way and that this would be the reason that he cannot have a semantic theory but be because this would uh, have us introduce meaning as a theoretical entity. You say this is this is not a good reason, uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's right because I don't think this is the position of Wittgenstein, actually. But then you say uh, there is a, lo a lot of better reason for his philosophic, for his semantic nihilism, that is that what you call a pro Christian enterprise of elaborating a semantic theory does not take into account the dynamism in which our language develops. But what you do is entirely different, that it uh, takes precisely into account this dynamism, and what it does is create a metalinguistic approach to studying our use of language. Uh, now, the, what I doubt about this is that Wittgenstein was very anxious not to let us uh, theorize about everything in philosophy, anything in philosophy. He was afraid that the very moment we lose con con contact with our real use in language, we will, be, we will fall into traps that language sets up for us. And I, I wonder how you uh, arm yourself against such traps in, in your metaphilosophical approach to linguistics. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's various ways in which one can be uh, in contact with the rough ground uh, that, that is so important to him, and that uh, contact is maintained uh, by appropriate philosophical uh, theorizing, in my view, if one is introducing vocabulary uh, with the specific expressive task of letting you say explicitly how ground level expressions are used. Uh, Wittgenstein himself prefers to uh, give us suggestive anecdotes that will remind us of features of uh, the use of the expressions. And I wouldn't claim that uh, it was a reasonable aspiration. I would not claim that it's a reasonable aspiration to make explicit all of the use of any uh, expression. But I do think it's sensible, it's a sensible aspiration to try and say explicitly, to, to make explicit some features of the use of uh, important ground level expressions, to say something about their inferential roles or uh, their uh, or the pragmatic force that their utterance uh, can have. Uh, the way I would think about it, uh, we keep control of that meta prag pragmatic meta vocabulary by stipulating how we're using it in uh, language that we take ourselves to understand well enough to do that. And then uh, the expressive role that it plays in making explicit features of the use of ground level vocabulary keeps us in contact with, keeps us controlled by uh, those practices of using the ground level, uh, the ground level vocabulary. So it seems to me we're not uh, unusually in danger of this metalinguistic vocabulary going on holiday uh, because we've kept explicit control over the use of the new vocabulary uh, by tying it to the use of the vocabulary uh, that it's that it has the expressive job of making explicit. Uh, so it seems to me that that it, it, in that way we can keep from being keep our use of the pragmatic meta vocabulary uh, 
from being metaphysically puzzling in the way that he diagnoses when we uh, carry over an analogy of the way some bit of the language works to the way some other bit of the language works when it's at when actually there's significant disanalogies. So uh, would it be fair to say that you don't really construct a theory in the in the way Wittgenstein criticizes, but rather you take his descriptive ways to a new level where you just include the expressive role of, of the meta vocabulary, but you don't construct a, a theoretical building out of that. Right. That I, I would like to think of it that way because the the task isn't uh, an explanatory task, but an expressive, but an expressive task. I mean, he wants us to describe the use of these things, and I'm suggesting that uh, uh, that's compatible with uh, systematically using uh, meta vocabulary uh, uh, to do it, and that's the way I understand. Uh, philosophical vocabulary, for instance, the logical vocabulary we were just talking about right. to, to make explicit inferential commitments. Well, yeah, right. Well, well, thank you very much. Um, I have nothing else to ask at this moment. And as soon as everything is prepared, we will stay in touch with you. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Thank you both. Well, thank you. It's, it's been great. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you pleasure for me. So pleasure. thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Goodbye. Bye-bye.